Uh, so today I'm going to start this topic. It's really very big and uh, I'm not sure that I can highlight it properly right now. So today it was like a small intro to this area and I believe we can continue further. So I encourage you to think about this topic from your side, from your project, collect some feedback and we can discuss it after this topic. Uh, what you can can identify like technical depth and how you manage manage it on your side. So it's very in interesting for me right now um, because for the last two or three years, uh, while I led in a couple of projects making review support of other projects, I face it that in our teams we face it with this like challenge to manage technical debt. And in most cases, we make it wrong. So we miss the point when we should uh, push back new features and insist to uh, make some technical stuff. Yeah. So for those who this term are new, maybe, so I, I believe it's very spread across the industry. But let's explain from the financial side. So debt is, for me, it's most convenient if we talk about finance. So for the business or for like personal life, you can achieve some things easily uh, by getting loan in the bank, for example. And you can buy stuff you want. So we already satisfied, everything is good. But um, in the long term, you should pay more. We know about that, we agreed with that. So there are, uh, small fee, maybe, maybe not so small, so it depends on situation, but uh, you should pay more than uh, rather you buy these uh, things or stuff by your own uh, finance. As the similar stuff, uh, I can like align, become in our industry as well. So uh, one of the uh, most common source of technical debts is a uh, Russian when uh, we try to deliver a feature as fast as possible to check the market, check the client needs, be agile as manager like said, and we often choose between right way and quick way. And unfortunately, quick way is win more often. Yeah, and that um, generates this like very obvious technical debt. Yeah, so we'll pay more so we will spend more time in develop new feature in the future if we not handle it properly even if if we develop right now in a fast and efficient way from a network perspective mm, how to avoid it uh, i believe it's on tech leads and senior staff so you should uh, push back a feature requests from the manager and argumented how you want to implement them yeah, so this feature <laughs> explain, I believe, in some cases how to do that. Um, another mm, source of technical debt is uh, outdated design, let's call it this way. So uh, we live in a world with a lot of changes. During the development, especially for long-term project, the requirements may change frequently, the situation may change, the use case may change, and uh, if we take a look a couple of uh, years back, we cannot even predict how system behave right now. Yeah, so it's very hard to predict, very hard to develop uh, and design system from scratch properly. So we always have this part that's a messy, uh, like unclear or not be designed properly since the beginning. So accept that it's normal. Uh, it's also some kind of art to uh, design things simple and proper from the scratch. My advice here to cover only necessary needs. So when use case is clear, then you cover it. I believe it's one of key features of Scrum approach when you, maybe even lean approach, when you uh, push back the implementation to the final stage. So you implement things. Uh, <laughs> Uh, not when you obtain it as a requirement. Uh, you try to be closer to deadlines and implement it when it's really necessary. Yeah. So it's it's tricky 
as for me approach, but it's worked very well. Um, okay, so just remind that design will change, decision may change, everything may change, and you should be ready for that. And as for me, Go is very uh, proper instrument in this area. So when you implement simple, when you make simple implementation with uh, covering only your needs, uh, this is good. It's easy to change, update in any time. Yep. Uh, by the way, if you have any question, you can interrupt me and we will discuss. Otherwise, we will discuss all your question after the talk. I believe it will be. I hope it will be. Okay, and third and uh, most toxic, I believe, uh, technical debt is generated by us developers. Um, if we uh, behave like in not mature way. So it's uh, became very clear when uh, you talk with teams and they don't understand the idea of the project overall or don't, don't understand clearly the initial design of the system. Um, we may bring some additional complex to the system if just uh, try to do our job without thinking of, of the system overall again. Sorry for reputation. Um, so main idea here to spend some time and uh, get know the system well, real well, and then proceed of the implementation and uh, make accurate changes to the system, incremental changes to the system. Because when we work in, in a long-term project, like a couple of years, uh, team may change entirely and no one knows the system from the beginning. And so you should build this knowledge for maybe by the document, by the code base, but spend some time and uh, get real good on it and try to reduce the extra complexity that brings by reputation, copy paste or cargo code. So be very careful with existing solution, especially if it's a big uh, complex code base with a lot of um, components, a lot of abstraction. And uh, at this image, they try to explain uh, this normal like uh, bounds of acceptable acceptable te technical depths because when uh, create a new feature become uh, very like uh, even very easy feature where a small feature become very costly uh, it means that you have a huge technical depth technical depth will slow down the velocity of the team will increase complexity will increase the cost of support and maintenance of the solution. So try to eliminate it as fast as possible and uh, try to keep technical debt as low as possible. Yeah. And of course, one of the sources of technical debt is using anti-patterns in, uh, in the solution. So what's the difference between patterns and anti-patterns? How to identify them? And uh, it's also <laughs> some, some piece of art um, because anti-patterns looks the same as patterns and they also try to help us and provide some solution. Uh, but the difference is that this solution may not work with some period of time or make our code base or our solution more complex for understanding and maintenance. So, it's hard to predict what become an anti-pattern. Yeah, but um, every time when your system becomes unclear for you, uh, or it brings a lot of additional complexity to the system, uh, it's, uh, it's better to reduce this in any way. I can provide some examples of anti-pattern. So uh, I believe most obvious one at it's over abstraction uh, and it's also controversial with what we are doing because our job as engineers uh, provide and using a good level of abstraction. By abstraction we can create a complex software and achieving our goals. But uh, 
it's another way, uh, another side of this problem that we can use over abstraction in our system and that make our system more complex. Um, we have a lot of different stuff in our system and it's hard to maintain, hard to understand. Yeah, so I believe uh, over abstraction is combined with simplicity. So from one side, we try to make our solution simple by abstraction. But if we overuse this, we make it even complex. Complex. Yeah, then without. Okay. Uh, I believe picture will, will explain <laughs> more clearly. Uh, let's see is uh, some tiny example. For, uh, many of our system require configuration. We have, I believe last year, regarding that, how we can configure our system and which approach we can use for that. And uh, uh, some kind, of course, is this very simplified, uh, simplified variant is to use such kind of interface for configuration and reuse uh, this code base. So you may be drawn by dry principle, um, but uh, it lead, leads to a lot of weakness in your program. For example, um, we have very good abstraction, highly reusable, um, we can uh, afford more efficient memory using by putting a reference to the configuration instead of copying the structure, etc., and reusing them across our code base and different projects. But uh, what's on another side, we have um, that our configuration is depends on the order how we set up it. In this example, we have, of course, very trivial one. So we just have two function is set up and do. It's very easy. And we assume that set up, uh, set up already consume configurations that are already prepared. Yeah, it's very obvious. But uh, in complex system, when we have a lot of dependency, a lot of stuff to for configuration, uh, it may become unclear defining this dependency between uh, uh, these components. Yeah, so the order of this configuration will depend. Uh, for example, we configure our proxy to subsystems, and also we configure a uh, connection to the database that validate this subsystem exists or validate uh, the keys for accessing the system. And if we uh, put it in the wrong direction, uh, we will fail to connect them. Yeah. Also supporting such system become a mess because it's hard to find the proper key of this variable. We never know where it's uh, lying. The configuration itself uh, does belong to the application. It starts belong to the dependency as well and defining this dependency. Uh, support this and maintain system became uh, very hard. And as you remember, we use empty interface and it's, uh, we lose type safety here. We should make every time type assertion, etc. So it's a tricky part. As you remember, we propose to use exact structure, uh, type structure in each package to configure each model separately and provide this as, uh, uh, the configuration as part of API of the package. It's become clear and um, explicitly how we can configure our system and each model require only necessary configuration. So very easy, it's for me. Um, another also common mistake in the couple of project is uh, unclear error message. So I see recently that, uh, or frequently, that error message don't answer the question why why it fails, why this error happens, and what we need to do to reduce this error. So it's very important to take more efforts to provide more clear message and uh, describe the users, what should be changed and what should be fixed. And I believe it's very clear. Yeah, in this example is, uh, of course, it's a very small example of code, it's like just uh, give a hint, but let's imagine a huge distributed systems and uh, you should be able by one error message to define what's, what's the root cause of the issue and how to fix it. It's 
very important as for me <laughs> as for support. And one more thing that we assume that error is for development team. I believe that's not. So yeah, we built our logic in code base relying on the error. Uh, the error handling is very important and we should make it properly, of course. We can build our custom errors as different codes inside the system. But uh, the actual uh, user of this error message, it will be the support team and it may not belong to the team. Yeah, so you write this message to other people who don't know really the system. They may know some information about it, what company include, how they interact with each other, but not so much. Yeah, they not go to the code base, don't look at the lines of code, so stack trace for them is useless. So consider this, that as well. And uh, the next part <laughs> will be I will next time when I uh, combine more feedbacks from you and we can continue. For today, I want to recap and uh, summarize this topic just and concentrate your attention to just two things. One of them is to use simple solution for today's challenges and close them. Don't try to uh, or over engineer and all create some abstractions that cover all needs and become like silver, silver bullet for all your challenges in the future. We uh, intend to create very complex system to cover the needs that don't exist and maybe not exist anymore in the future as well. Yeah, so just when you're thinking about design or your system, this is good as for me a checklist that we can ask yourself this question and uh, identify the possible uh, technical depths that occur and already start tackling them. Okay, so do functions and methods return only concrete types. As you remember, it's uh, good practice to return the concrete types everywhere. Is the ratio of public concrete, uh, concrete types and public abstract types at least one to one, uh, two to one? Yeah, so concrete types and public abstract types is a comparison between types and interfaces. So keep it not so abstract. Um, uh, do the majority of interfaces expose only necessary functionality of the packages where, uh, where they are used? So when we're talking about uh, interfaces, we intend to combine different contracts together and that's make a lot of the interface. So try to keep it simple, uh, split it, it to the pieces yeah, and use by the client only necessary one, not all of the huge interface. Are all abstraction well documented and clear in their purpose and usage? So we also intend to create abstraction or put it different names and <laughs> it's very hard to understand what's the reason of this abstraction, what it's really, really purpose and how we are going to use it and what's um, encapsulate under this abstraction. Yeah, so provide, please, please provide a good documentation for that. Uh, I'm not sure that you all used, but I used such approach, but when I came to a new project, I just used GoDoc to see the documentation of the project. It's helped to understand the APIs, contracts, the entities they are using in the project and create the first uh, thought about how it could be implemented under the hood and then go to the code base. And do abstraction ethically def uh, defend the application from runtime errors and panics. So it's also a source of some issues when you have a lot of abstraction, you should uh, use type casting a lot, you should maybe even use reflection to implement your logic and that may lead to runtime errors and panics. So try to avoid that as well. Okay, I believe I am done for today. This is a small list of very interesting uh, materials that I ask you to review and to read. So most of the um, text on the slides from these sources. Mm, I just add tiny piece from my side, from my experience and share my pain on the project. 
Okay, so I believe that's all. And thank you for your attention. I hope you have enough time to think about um, technical debt management on your project and ready to share with me uh, your ideas, your approaches, how you manage it.